Hello and welcome back to our AMD Behemoth custom build. Since the last video, I've just been finishing some bits off, so I've made all the custom cables. You can see they're all in place. I've also installed both the power supplies. That was necessary because you couldn't get access to the bottom power supply once this, this mini ITX board was installed. So both power supplies are in and also been doing a bit of tidying up of the cables around the back of the system. There's still a lot to do. We've got two GPU water blocks to install, uh, 6800 XT, 6900 XT. There's obviously the whole custom loop to build, so that's gonna take a bit of time. Uh, a couple of SATA SSDs need installing around the back of the system. We chose these Samsung Cuvos. These are just um, kind of storage drives. We have some Corsair MP600 core, two terabyte drives, one for each system. They're gonna be the main drives for the operating system, installing programs. Towards the end of the video, when the system is up and running, fingers crossed, um, we'll be looking at the performance, running some benchmarks, maybe things like Cinebench, some gaming benchmarks. I also wanna take a look at how the AMD software can help improve performance, mainly in gaming, so see how the Adrenaline software with new features such as FSR and automatic overclocking as well, see how we can use that software to improve performance. Before we get on with this though, I just wanna quickly ask you guys, subscribe to the channel, like the video if you've enjoyed the series, and if you wanna help support Kit Guru, you can always head over to our store, pick up some Kit Guru merch, you could also subscribe to our Patreon, and there's a new feature on YouTube now where you can become a member of the channel, so click the join button if you wanna see your options for joining the Kit Guru channel. And as always, if you wanna catch up on the in-depth technical reviews, head over to the website. Before I get into finishing off the build, building the custom loop, installing those GPU water blocks, I just wanna have a quick recap of what we're doing for maybe those people that are just joining us for the first time. So the plan is to build a dual system, a very high spec dual system inside this Corsair 1000D chassis. This chassis is designed for dual systems. Main system at the top here, and then a secondary mini ITX system is installed on top of that power supply shroud. In the main system, there is a TRX40 Aorus Extreme motherboard. So you've got all the latest features such as PCIe Gen 4, CPU, is an AMD Ryzen Threadripper 3970X, so 32 cores, 64 threads, really powerful CPU, should be able to handle anything you can throw at it, photo editing, video editing, 3D rendering, anything you want, that should be able to handle, and then paired with that system is a 6900 XT gaming OC from Gigabyte, again, a great compute card. The second system, you can see installed on top of this power supply shroud is a mini ITX system, X570 Aorus Pro Wi-Fi motherboard, again PCIe Gen 4, an AMD Ryzen 9 5900 X CPU, 12 cores, 24 threads, probably overkill for gaming, but we like overkill, especially in this system. 32 gig of RAM in the gaming system and 64 gig in the top high-end desktop system. That gaming system as well is gonna be having this reference edition uh, Radeon RX 6800 XT card installed. Both are gonna be water-cooled, and that is, again, a very powerful gaming GPU. Should be ideal. You could even throw 4K gaming at that, and it shouldn't break much of a sweat. And then, as I've mentioned as well, uh, the main system and the second system, we've got PCIe Gen 4 storage for the main Windows installation drive some SATA SSDs for storage as well. And obviously the whole system is gonna be water-cooled. That's one thing that needs finishing off. So we've got two 480 mil rads up front, two 360s in the top, push-pull fan configuration, all of these. So the whole system, I think, if I remember correctly, it's been that long since I installed them. There's 30 fans in total in here. And these are all controlled by the Corsair Commander Pro units. So we've got four Commander Pros and I think um, six or eight RGB hubs. That took a long time to install. Custom cables, what I've made myself. We've added some high airflow panels to the case. That's pretty much it. That's where we're up to now. Really now I need to get on with finishing this off. So the first thing I need to do is install these GPU water blocks. I think I'll install the Corsair block to this 6800 XT first because the Corsair block probably is the easier out of the two to install. Uh, Corsair does make it really easy for the end user with these Hydro X blocks because basically all you need to do is remove this plastic cover, uh, disassemble your original cooler, prepare the bare PCB and then you just basically just bolt this down 
to the graphics card. What Corsair does is they cut all these thermal pads, pre-apply those and pre-apply the thermal compound. It makes it really simple. That's probably the most time consuming part of installing a GPU block is cutting all these thermal pads and making sure you get them in the right place. So hats off to Corsair really for that. It makes it really simple to install a GPU water block. And I suppose that might be something that puts people off running their own custom loop having to dismantle the card can be a daunting task for anybody that's not done it before but knowing that you've got all the thermal pads in the right place kind of puts your mind at rest a little bit if you're not experienced with it so i'll install that block first then move on to the 6900 xt if you watch the first video in this series i had a bit of trouble finding a water block for that code the corsair reference one doesn't fit uh, but we managed to get an ek block so this EK block is actually for the 6800 XT, 6900 XT Aorus Master. That card uses the same PCB layout as this gaming OC card. So I'm pretty sure that fits. It is listed officially on the uh, EK website, but not using their configurator tool. You actually have to go onto the page for that specific block and it does show the gaming OC card as supported. So. That second, but first, we'll fit this Hydro X XG7 to the reference edition RX Once you have removed the stock cooler, given the uh, the die and the memory chips and the VRM a quick clean, remove the protective cover from the back of this card, and then you want to sit it on a box because when you lower the GPU block on the I/O shield plate doesn't interfere and it hangs over the edge of the box. It allows you to place the uh, the card in the right position. So all the thermal pads and the thermal paste are pre-applied so now we just need to line this up with the screw holes that's pretty good and then we need to position the back plate over the back of the PCB you'll notice there's, there's no passive cooling with this back plate no thermal pads on there so that just lines up with the screw holes and then now we've got lots of screws just to uh, to fasten this down There you go, that's the XG7 water block fitted to the 6800 XT reference card. A red custom spray job on the front and then the stock black back plate on the back of the card. That's how easy it is to fit one of these Hydro X water blocks. There is a bit more work involved with fitting the EK block compared to the Hydro X. Uh, as I mentioned, you've got to cut the thermal pads to size and you've got to position them correctly on the PCB. So. It is more time consuming than fitting one of these compared with the Corsair XG7, but it's a, a similar process. First you need to dismantle the card, so you need to take off the stock cooler. I've already disassembled this card once before, so the uh, PCB is pretty clean. Just going to give the GPU die a quick, quick clean with some isopropyl alcohol. Next, you need to cut the thermal pads to size. With this water block, all the thermal pads are the same thickness. Not always the case that, so that makes things a little easier. You don't actually get an installation manual supplied in the box with the EK water block, but what you do get is a uh, online installation manual so i just pulled that up on my phone so i'll just keep that handy and that shows you where where the uh, thermal pad should be positioned on the pcb so i'll get on with cutting these up 
placing them on the PCB and then after that we can uh, we can actually fit the water block to the card. All the thermal pads are fitted in the correct positions. I need to apply some thermal compound to the GPU die. EK does supply some thermal compound in the kit, but I'm going to use this Arctic MX5 instead. I've just placed the block on top of the card it's quite easy to line up this block because it's acrylic you can see through where the screw holes are so it's pretty easy to align it but then we do need to flip it over and rest it on the box to fit the screws there's some that go directly to the PCB that hold the GPU block in place and then there's another six that hold the backplate on oh and this is a custom backplate as well well it's actually the EK stock backplate, but I've had this Aorus logo etched on there just to just to jazz it up a bit. So I purposely left some of the screws out of the PCB because they actually go through the backplate and attach the backplate to the PCB. Before we do that, you need to put some thermal pads on the back of this PCB because unlike the Corsair backplate, this EK backplate does offer some passive cooling to the back of the card. So again, EK installation manual for the backplate is online. So I've just got that up on my phone as a reference. So I'll cut these to size put them in the correct positions and then screw the back plate on and then we should be done. Okay, so that is the EK block fitted to the 6900 XT. It is a little bit more time consuming than the Corsair Hydro X block because you have to cut those thermal pads. That's the back plate. But even with having to cut those pads, it doesn't take that long. And as long as you follow the installation manual, you shouldn't find it too difficult at all. So that's it. 6900 XT and the 6800 XT ready to be installed in the system. The 6900 XT has been fitted into the system. When I fitted that to the system, I then realized that I'm probably gonna have to build the custom loop up in two stages because uh, if I fit this other card in its place down at the bottom here, it's gonna hamper access into the CPU and to those fittings and it's gonna make it difficult to just to make up those bits of hard tubing. So I'm gonna leave the 6900 XT in and concentrate on the main system first. Uh, you can see I've also made some tubing that links the radiators up, so the front 360 and 480, that's going to be used on the ITX system, and then the back 360 that you can't really see, and the back 480, that's going to be used for cooling the main system. So those radiators are linked together, and the plan is to use this reservoir for the main system, so I'm going to come out here, go straight along, and then into the CPU block, then out of the CPU block, and it's gonna go up and then round the RAM. 
back down and then into the GPU block. That way I'm going from the correct inlet and outlet ports of the CPU block into the correct inlet port on the GPU block. Although according to EK, it doesn't make that much difference in uh, temperature of the GPU, whether you use the inlet and outlets the correct way around. So I'll come out of the GPU down at the bottom here, go across and then up and then into that top 360 rad. And then obviously the 360 rad is connected to the 480 come out of the 480 there and then bring it back down into the pump res uh, this side. So I've also got a drain in there as well. Uh, it's probably not the optimal position, but at least it will drain most out of the uh, pump res and out of this top radiator and probably the CPU block as well. So it might you know, save um, a bit of mess if I have to drain the system. And then for the ITX system at the bottom, I'm obviously going to be using this pump res combo that's lower down and similar kind of setup. I'll be coming out here into the CPU block in the correct inlet port, out of the CPU block to the GPU, and then from the GPU, I'm going to take it along here and then up into this top 360 rad. Again, the 360 rad is connected to the 480, so it'll come out of the 480. Um, just miss this fitting here, come down and then back into the pump res there and again another drain in the same place so i think i've got everything i need to make up the loop so let's see how it goes
Okay, so the AMD behemoth is finally completed. Um, it's looking pretty good. It probably looked on the video quite easy making this loot, but I can assure you that it was very time consuming. Almost two days it took me to build the loop and finish off with the cable management and everything else. It's probably one of the most tricky custom walkable builds I've done for a long time. The reason for that is because you technically got two loops in one case. What I had to do basically was make up all the tubing, do all the bends and get everything positioned for the main system first. And then some of the tubing I couldn't connect up permanently, especially the ones to the graphics card. Uh, I then had to take that graphics card out to get access to the bottom system. So it was a time consuming job. Uh, some of these tubing runs were quite simple, like this one to the CPU and obviously one to, from the radiator back to the pump there. They were quite simple, but then over this side, you've got some quite difficult ones as well with multiple different bends going in different directions as well, especially these coming from the graphics cards up to that top radiator and space up at the top there. Uh, was quite limited to get your hand in, but I think it looks really good. Red's one of my favorite colors, so the color scheme works really well for me. Might not be everyone's cup of tea. RGB lighting at the moment, all the fans are just in a solid red. So you can see all the fans in the system are just set to a solid red color. So are the GPU blocks, the RGB on the motherboard and the pump res combos, all those are in a solid red. But just to add a bit of life to the system, I've just done this like stack on the uh, RGB lighting on the memory on the main system and on the ITX system. You can't really see it if you're looking at it straight on, but if you're looking down, you can see that. So yeah, I'm happy with how it's turned out. Let us know what you think of it. Is this something that you'd like? Don't forget, we are giving this system away in a competition. So one of you guys could be the proud owner of this system very soon. Make sure you uh, have a look at our Facebook page regularly. Don't forget to check the Kit Guru site as well. The details of that uh, competition will be on there very soon. So make sure you check our Facebook and check the Kit Guru website to be in with a chance of winning this system. Now that the build's complete, the only real things left to do is to have a look at the performance. I also want to check the, uh, the running temperatures of everything um, just to make sure that the loop not only looks good, it is actually doing its job. So first I'm gonna have a look at that, the, the CPU and GPU temperatures. And then afterwards, I'm gonna have a look and see how the AMD software, the uh, Radeon Adrenaline software, how that can help boost performance without having to put in too much effort. And also look at some other features of the Radeon software as well. Uh, new features that have been recently added such as FSR. I might quickly have a look as well at Ryzen Master and see about any automatic overclocking. Also, there is automatic overclocking as well in the Radeon software as well, so I'll have a look at that. Normally, if it was my own system, I'd probably do some manual overclocking on the CPU and the GPU as well, but because this is going to someone else uh, in the competition, I don't want there to be any instabilities that they have to deal with. While I've just been filming this last bit of video, I've also been running some stress tests on the system. So you can see on the monitor that we've got Cinebench R23 running, and we've also got Heaven Benchmark. So that's gonna be stressing the CPU and the GPU at the same time. It'll show us that whether the custom loop is doing its job. So as you can see, currently the CPU temperature is at 71.5 degrees C, around about that hovering between 71 and 70. It looks pretty stable actually at 71 degrees, so that looks pretty good. Just jumped up a little, but dropping back down now to 72.5, so that looks good. Uh, there's no precision boost overdrive, uh, nothing implemented on the CPU at the moment. Uh, just basically gone into the BIOS and just enabled the XMP profile for the memory. So everything is technically running at stock at the moment. So 71, 72 degrees, this benchmark's been running for about 15 minutes now. So that's looking pretty good. The benchmarks are running on the 5900X system. So the ITX system at the bottom. One thing I've been slightly concerned about with that system is there's not a huge amount of airflow down there because the majority of the airflow will be going upwards through the top of the case and maybe some out of the back. But down here, there's not a lot of airflow. 
so I was slightly concerned about the uh, about the temperatures of the ITX system but looking at the CPU temperature that's good at 71 degrees currently the CPU package power is around about 130 watt while Cinebench is running CPU is under 100% load same with the GPU as well that is under 100% load while Heaven Benchmark's running and currently that's sat at 51 degrees so both those temperatures CPU and GPU look pretty good I'm quite happy with how they are I've opened Ryzen Master and I find it a really useful bit of software actually Ryzen Master for anybody that's got a AMD Ryzen CPU whether it's a desktop CPU or Threadripper CPU it works on both. Basically what it is is an overclocking tool. Instead of having to go into the BIOS it allows you to overclock in Windows quite easily. It's not simple but no overclocking is. Uh, there is a manual mode so you can set the CPU frequency, set the voltage manual if you want. I'm not going to look at that at the moment because I don't want to create any instabilities but there is also in there um, automatic overclocking feature so it's quite simple really the main dashboard of the Ryzen Master there's just a button for auto OC you just click on that apply and test click OK and then the system will restart now when the system does restart it runs its own stress tests as you can see now on screen so it's just the software just checking that the system is stable with the automatic overclock that it's applied so it runs these stress tests and then once it's finished the stress tests if it's been successful it'll say that it is successful down at the bottom and then now you should have a little bit more performance from your CPU so I'll just go back to the stress test that I was doing earlier so you can see with that overclock applied the CPU package power has gone up now before it was around 130 watts now it's between 145 to 160 watts so CPU is definitely pulling more power you can see there's been a slight increase as well in the CPU temperature now it's just 76 degrees but still that's well within an acceptable range so happy with how that's looking so far I'll leave this running for a bit and then and, uh, come back in about 15 minutes and see what's happened to those temperatures as well as measuring the CPU usage and package power and the temperatures you can also see on HW info we've got the individual core frequencies up there with the CPU in its stock configuration before we were running at about 4.15 to 4.2 gigahertz across all cores now that we've got the automatic overclocking and we're running a little bit higher at about 4.25 to 4.3 gigahertz across all cores so you can see the uh, Ryzen Master automatic overclocking it does give you a bit more performance but with that extra performance obviously comes a little bit more heat so the CPU temperature now you can see is around about 78 degrees so it's gone up about 7 or 8 degrees C but that is still well within tolerance for these CPUs I'd be happy running this 24-7 now like this so I think I'll leave this automatic overclock on and have a look now at the GPU automatic overclocking as well because as well as CPU overclocking through the Radeon uh, Adrenaline Edition software you can actually do some automatic overclocking on the GPU so we'll go into the adrenaline software and then look at performance go to tuning you have to accept the agreement before you do any tuning so tuning control at the moment is set to automatic you can also choose manual as well so you can adjust the GPU core speed and you can adjust voltages on there that's not something I'm going to do because again I said I don't want to introduce any instability into the system so instead we'll go on to the automatic a few different options so you got default undervolt GPU so automatic undervolting so you just get a warning coming up saying that undervolting could make your system crash or have instabilities so you can just click proceed there if that's what you want to do so you can undervolt the GPU not going to do that what I'm looking at is overclocking so again you get the warning saying that overclocking could introduce instability I'll click proceed on that anyway and again the software is doing some automatic GPU overclocking set it at uh, 2474 megahertz so I'll click OK on that so what that's done it has set a target for the GPU core to achieve so it's targeting 2474 megahertz and with heaven benchmark running it's hovering between about 2000 to 2300 megahertz never actually has reached the 2474 target you can see there it's 2,354, 2,362 so you can see the dynamic boosting of the GPU core 
it's getting up close to that 2474 let's have a look at the temperature now so again it's not been running too long and we're only up to 48 degrees c so it looks pretty consistent as well um Again, CPU temperature is around 78 degrees, so quite happy that the custom loop is working as it should. There's nothing to be worried about there with those temperatures, and the system looks stable as well. The automatic overclocking built into the Radeon Adrenaline Edition software is introducing some more heat to the system, uh, so it's obviously worked to a certain extent. But is it giving us any extra performance? I've just fired up 3D Mark. I'm just going to go back onto the Radeon software and switch it back to the default clock speed on the GPU. I'm just going to fire up TimeSpy, the 3D Mark TimeSpy benchmark. Uh, run it in the stock configuration, so at the default GPU speeds. And then after, I'll run it again with the automatic overclocking applied just to see what performance increase we're getting from that automatic overclocking. So that's finished and we've got an overall score of 16,770. I'm not really interested in the overall score. What I'm interested in is the graphics score. So we just have to remember on the stop frequencies, We've got a graphics score of 18,043. I can come back to that anyway, because it's logged. I'll go back into the adrenaline software and go back, it's like I said, it's really simple. Just click on the button that says overclock GPU and proceed. That very quickly applies the overclock to the GPU. Again, it's at 2474 megahertz, so 2474 is the target. We'll go back into 3D Mark and back onto the benchmark for Time Spy. Run that, see if we get any improvement in performance okay so that's the second benchmark finished so that's the one with the gpu overclock and as you can see the overall score has gone up from 16,000 to 17,000. but more importantly the graphics score has gone up by just under 300 points which is a decent increase as well for for automatic overclocking probably with a manual overclock you might get a bit more out of the card but it is a good performance increase so not only does the uh, automatic overclocking add more heat to the system it also adds more performance as well so i think with that we can say that the automatic overclocking built into the radeon software it works um you should see an improvement in gaming as well with that and as well as that we've run this benchmark which is a good stress test on the system and it also means that the stability is good. One thing that's also worth mentioning as well is it's quite a warm day today. The ambient temperature is pretty high. It's almost 26 degrees in the room and the fans as well. I've got those set at a static speed at 850 RPM. So that also means that you know, it, it, it kind of cements the fact that the cooling performance of the system is working well with such a low fan speed there is obviously 30 fans in the system but it just shows that you know it's 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 working well with a low fan speed and having that low fan speed means that the system is very quiet so you can hear it so it's virtually it's virtually silent when you think about the load that it's been put under it stays silent and it stays well within the limits of thermals that's quite impressive as well as the automatic overclocking there's more features in the radeon adrenaline software you can also use it to record and stream so if you want to record a game clip if you've just done something amazing in a game and you want to record that you can hit a uh, shortcut key to record you can also use it as a tool for streaming so if you want to live stream during gaming you can also do it like that as well so it's kind of a, an alternative to using something more difficult like obs to set up this is much more easy to set up it's all built into the user interface of the radeon software like software such as obs you can choose whether you just want to record an active window or whether you want to select a display so if you have multiple displays maybe you've got one for gaming and then one for like your discord and other things you can just select your gaming monitor and record that display. You can also capture your microphone and you can also set it to capture a camera as well. So if you've got a, a webcam or a camera pointing at your face, you can do that as well. It can also record your desktop. And then if you want to live stream, you can host yourself on uh, different platforms like uh, Twitch. Uh, you can use the software for that so it's like a an alternative to obs and uh, an alternative to nvidia shadow play as well 
So that's all built into the software as well. Another new AMD feature, Fidelity FX Super Resolution, or FSR for short, is also designed to improve gaming performance. Think of FSR as AMD's answer to DLSS, but unlike DLSS that only supports a limited amount of NVIDIA RTX cards, FSR supports AMD Radeon 6000, 5000 and earlier cards, as well as NVIDIA cards that are not supported by DLSS. This sounds like a real bonus for owners of those cards that were maybe thinking of upgrading the cards, maybe they might not have to just yet. FSR uses some very clever upscaling technology to help boost frames per second at a very slight cost of image quality. There's currently about 50 games that are supported by FSR. AMD is working to introduce it into more games. It is a setting that you have to enable actually in the game rather than the AMD software. In games such as Godfall it's really easy to enable FSR, you just need to go into the game settings menu, into the video settings and then you should find an option for AMD Fidelity FX Super Resolution or FSR in there. In Godfall we have it switched off at the moment and you've got options of ultra quality, quality, balanced or performance. If we switch to performance and then go back into the game you can see that there is, um, actually on performance, there is a noticeable drop in the image quality, but there is also a noticeable increase in frames per second. So currently we're getting around about 200 to 250 frames per second in this section of the game. It does up to over 300 when you look out into the distance there, but you can notice a bit of drop in image quality of these trees and Everything just looks quite soft with performance mode, but if we go back into settings and switch to quality, which is kind of the middle setting, and go back in the game, you can see the image is a lot sharper as well, but we have dropped a few frames. It's still pretty good at around about 200 to 250. It just dropped down to 160 FPS there where we're getting about 200 before but you can see the image quality has increased so if we go back into the settings again and turn off FSR again you can see we probably dropped about another 10 or 20 FPS in these areas we're dropping down to below 120 FPS 115 FPS where before in the quality mode we had around 160 FPS the difference between FSR off and quality, it's not that noticeable image quality, but if you switch to performance, the image quality does drop and it is very noticeable. So I'd probably recommend running FSR in either quality or balance mode, uh, unless you are really chasing every last FPS. You can see there how FSR will benefit people, especially with slightly older graphics cards. Maybe if you've got a Radeon 5000 series card and you're thinking you might want to upgrade to 6000, turn on FSR and that might change your mind. So that's it for the AMD Behemoth build. The system's looking good and it's running good as well. It's ready to go to its new owner. Don't forget, we have a competition coming very soon for one of you lucky guys to win this system. Make sure you keep an eye on our Facebook page and the KitGuru website to see details of how you could be the proud owner of this AMD behemoth system. So the series has come to an end and I hope you've enjoyed watching it as much as I've enjoyed building the system. It has probably been one of the most demanding builds I've done in a long time, but I think it's turned out great and I've really enjoyed doing it. Let us know what you think of the system in the comments section. And if you've enjoyed watching this series, make sure you hit the subscribe button and like the video. Uh, if you wanna also help KitGuru, you can head over to our store, pick up some merch or maybe you could even subscribe to our Patreon. And as always, you can head over to the website to catch up on all the in-depth technical reviews. And if you wanna get in touch with us, you can do through social media such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and through our Discord channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.